Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. This episode is titled Early Season Mahi Off Atlantic Beach. I'm going to be talking to Captain Mike Dupree of the X-Rated Fishing Team and Lone Wolf Sport Fishing Charters operating out of Harker's Island. And we're going to cover the basics. We're going to cover everything, the when, where, why, um, what and how. So we're going to cover it all in this episode of Early Season Mahi off Atlantic Beach. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community of North Carolina since 2003. We've been bringing you fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, and now here in our most recent efforts, the Saltwater Podcast Series. And it's in this Saltwater Podcast series that we reach out to our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and ask them to share with us their insight, their knowledge on how to catch more fish more often. And we hope that that knowledge and insight inspires you, motivates you, gives you the confidence to get you and your family and your friends out on the water spending more time together more often. I'm joined in this episode, just as I am every episode, with my podcast partner, Billy Thorpe of Copilot Studios, a podcast podcast studio offering podcast services for hire. Billy, how you doing? <laughs> Gary, I'm doing good, man. I'm just over here at the podcast. <laughs> no. The podcast, <laughs> rocking it. Hey, man, podcast, podcast. It's, we're talking about coast. Love it, man. So, yeah, dude, it's been good. We've been in the studio a lot today shooting so it's been a, it's been a good time man good to looking forward to this last episode of the night crush this thing out man it's yeah man great. the creative process um you know we're talking fishing and getting good reception on our efforts and we enjoy that man looking forward to talking to captain mike tonight yeah absolutely and real quick before we get started here just want to shout out to our sponsors uh here is a ra hitch a raleigh apex hitch they got hitches trailers bike racks and all kinds of stuff for uh, all your trailer needs so go check those guys out chris and his team as i always say do a great job have a great brand um and we're big fans of them, man they actually reach out to us and uh, so we're big fans of uh, fisherman's post podcast we want to support it and uh, we appreciate those guys a lot so go support them and when you do go buy something get 20 bucks off 20 so. bucks off man i think people like doing business with like-minded people man so here's yeah. a dude that wanted to sponsor the podcast and I think that's reason enough for the audience to say, let me look more closely at R.A. Hitch and what R.A. Hitch has to offer. Absolutely. And also one of our favorite sponsors uh, that's been with us since the very early days, very beginning, Marine Warehouse Center. Got a quick video from those guys. We'll be right back. Hey, it's Robbie with Marine Warehouse Center in Wilmington and Charleston. We are headquarters for Pair Custom Boats. These center consoles are handmade in Washington, North Carolina, and are custom designed for fishing and family fun on the water. Right now, we have several models in stock. The deal times on the custom orders are around five months. These boats are custom built to fit your needs from the seating, the tops, the leaning posts, and the live wheels. You design the entire layout of your boat. Come by and see for yourself why they're one of the fastest growing boat builders in the country. That music will get you jacked up even after a long day. Yeah, man. <laughs> Murray uh, Warehouse. Love it, man. Love it. Love those guys. Always uh, always being supportive of the community. And is Terrell still telling jokes? He's still calling you? Oh, man. I mean, I'm, cl I'm close to blocking. <laughs> I'm close to blocking and telling him, just call Billy. Uh, Billy's Billy loves your work anyway, Terrell. But, yes, he is still calling. Right. And, yes, I do have a joke. And... I'm guessing that you're going to think it's better than I do, but let's see, right? That's we'll what see. we do. Never know. All right. Terrell, Terrell's joke. Again, not Gary's joke. Terrell's, Terrell's joke. Why are fishermen below average boxers? Below, I don't know. Because all they throw are hooks. <laughs> 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 Someone in the background laughed. <laughs> See, it's not only approved by us, but approved by our guest who's in the background. That's perfect. 
Good job. That, uh, what a stinger. That might disqualify him that he yeah. laughed so heartily at that bad joke. You know what? This is the episode no one ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Hard drive crashed. No, I'm just messing. Oh, man, Gary. Let's see. What do you want to see? You want to see a fish picture? Yeah, man. Here Always we... want to see a fish picture. Here we go. We got James Long of C. Wickley. I guess that's how you say it. Pen- Pennsylvania caught this 38-inch king mackerel off the rock jetty at Riceville Beach. He's menhaden while freelining. That's pretty pretty dope picture, and I couldn't get it all in there. But he's fishing with his grandfather, so yeah, man, good, good smile, right? We love people with a we love people when they smile big with the fish photo. They don't take themselves too seriously. Yeah, yeah, I never smile with fish photos. I always lay in the bottom of the boat so you can't see where I'm fishing. <laughs> That's an old trick. That's a pro tip for you guys out there. You don't want to see anybody. You don't want to share your fishing spot, lay in the bottom of the boat, and take a selfie with a picture of the fish. Whatever. Fish laying on top of you. We're going to get through this episode. I swear we are. Man, what a good pro tip. <laughs> it was pro. Because <laughs> I'm such a guru. We just lost 100, 100 viewers. <laughs> Well, for the rest of you that (laughs) like my pro tip, you can give me a pro tip at buymeacoffee.com slash Fisherman's Post. How'd you like that? Professional segue. That was was professional right there. Uh, So yeah, Buy Me a Coffee is a cool place where you can go uh, support creators such as Gary and I who create podcasts, create content. If you like what we do, feel free to support us, buy us a cup of coffee. And uh, with, with or without buying us a cup of coffee, Feel free to send us uh, what you want to hear, what you want to talk about, who you want to hear from. We always love show suggestions. So we do. It's a, always a good time, man. So buymeacoffee.com. We do. And I'm getting ready uh, getting ready to talk to Captain Mike Dupree. But before I do, Billy, this is when I remind you that I'll be coming back after my conversation with Mike to ask you for Billy's best takeaway. Sounds good, man. I'm going to be ready. All right. Well, let's bring on, let's welcome to the show, Captain Mike Dupree of X-Rated Fishing Team and Lone Wolf Sport Fishing Charters out of Harkers Island. It's great to be talking to you again, Mike. Hey, what's up, dude? How are you? Man, I'm doing good. And again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ignore how much you laughed at that bad joke, and I'm still going to (laughs) treat you as a professional and a serious-minded angler. I'm going to ignore that. And it is good to talk to you. And and with you being familiar with the show, I'm not. I know I don't have to tell you, but I'm saying it more for our viewers and listeners. You got two questions coming to you. You let me know when you're ready, Mike, and I'll give you the first of two. Hey, last time I got one of them right, and you counted it wrong because Google lied to you about the wolf. Yes. <laughs> so I can't believe I'm the ha- internet lied to me. I can't believe I'm- the internet didn't give me actual factual information. <laughs> I'm a half of a point ahead right now. Deal. Um, yeah, I think you're going to pass tonight's test. It's just one, but I think, you're, well, maybe I'll make it two. We'll see. Hey, question number one, though. Why should anyone listen to what you have to say about a mahi? Okay. Mahi is the fish I cut my teeth on as far as pelagics go. Um, I was kind of into king fishing until I caught mahi, which was an accident on it would take. 20 minutes to explain the story, but I accidentally caught Mahi when I was about 20 years old off the back of a 13 and a half foot Boston whaler. Um, I had been red fishing that morning before, um, went outside the Cape. One of my lures came off my rod, was dragging behind the boat, saw a bunch of snakes. I didn't know what it was. I cast at it, turned into a dolphin, been hooked ever since. Kind of the same thing with my Wahoo stuff. With that being said, I run a charter boat along with charter, um, sport fishing charters, and our Mahi is our it's not, I'm not going to say day saver, but it's our go-to fish. Like I know if I'm out there where I need to be, I can catch mahi. Um, they're, it's a prolific species. They're here year round. They're fairly simple to catch. You can catch them on a 70 foot sport fish custom yacht, or you can catch them on a 15 foot John boat with a tiller handle. So, um, I think my social media proves that I know how to catch dolphin. Got plenty of pictures. All right, man. I'm in, I'm in, I'm hooked. I want to hear what you have to say <laughs> right after. I want to hear what you say right after we answer question number two. I'll remind you that I am an English professor. So mahi-mahi is called a repetitive duplicate. Mahi-mahi. You got me so far? Can you name... They named it twice. Can you name two other repetitive duplicates? Repetitive duplicates. Like mahi-mahi. Right. Like not fish-related. doesn't have to be fish-related. No. Can you give me one? 
<laughs> Probably not right off the top of my head. Billy? Yo yo. Uh, yes. Oh, all right. Yes. 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 Yo yo. Well, that's a good one. He cr- he killed it. Never mind. I don't yeah, need you, Billy. You don't need me. All right. Couscous. I had a really good one too. Pom pom. You're lost. <laughs> walla walla. Is that real? <laughs> it's a real town in Washington. Oh, hey, okay. Let's talk Mahi. All, all right. right. I like your approach, man. I like the simple approach. We got when, where, why, what, and how. So let's start. I get we can either do when or where. It's up to you. What are we going to do? Well, everybody wants to know when. All right. And as I'm looking at my watch, now's the time. Um, typically, mid middle of April, we start getting dolphins to show up, and they actually last all the way through into September. Um, down here, you, you can catch them year round, really, but the best times is April, May, June, May and June being your gaffer times. And then the fish, they just, you start getting more abundant fish and you start going from, you know, just pretty much gaffers all day to gaffers and, and, and bailers and then bailers and slingers and slingers and chickens and chickens and peanuts. There's so many names for dolphin. It's insane. Um, but when second week, third week of April, they start to move in. Um, there was been a couple caught this week that I know of. I haven't caught any because I've been fishing. I've been chasing turkeys all week. But the uh, as May gets in here, the bigger class of fish get here, uh, and they get thicker. They they're showing up in more places. They're uh, in the Gulf Stream, of course, but working their way up, doing their their annual migration, if you will. So as far as when, I know I'm repeating myself. April, May, June is your best time for gaffers. They're here all through the summer and into the fall. Why is it that we see the bigger ones right there in that May June slot? Any uh, any theory on that? Have you looked into it? I don't know. Um, I have a lot of buddies that fish in Florida, South Carolina, Georgia, and in Florida, like you know, their sail fishery for sailfish is during the cold winter months of January, February, and into March, and about this same time every year, they start seeing their gaffers. So I'm, I'm thinking the way mahi work is they they migrate up the Atlantic coast and they go up around into the Labrador current and they go around Bermuda and they go back down to make a big circle. They just keep doing that. So I think that that bigger class of fish can withstand and they can thrive in that little bit cooler water. Whereas the smaller fish need to be in that warmer water, which won't get here until a little later. But I think, in my theory, you know, that's what I think. I don't know. Okay. And then what about what about where? I mean, and that's almost always the money question, maybe more of the money question inshore than offshore, but I'm certainly the people who are watching this are like, man, tell me where to go. Like, help me out. Yeah, where to go is pretty simple. Um, in these months, the early months, April and May, we are typically we're Wahoo fishing in the stream, in the Gulf Stream, right off the break. Uh, and the break being the where the continental shelf falls off. So the fish are using the Gulf Stream to migrate. And when we when when they're coming up through the stream or you know the streams moving forward, that's usually the water temperatures are like right now it's like between 72 to 78 degrees. Um and see what happens is as the as the Gulf Stream comes up and the, the, the winds change and storms come and the weather changes, it'll actually make eddies and stuff spin off of the, of the Gulf Stream. And those eddies will carry bait and plankton and chlorophyll and wherever that is, is where the fish are. So at this time of the year, the fish are going to be more concentrated in that Gulf Stream because that's where the warmer water is. Now, as the weather warms up and we get better temperatures and sunnier days and calmer seas and we get like a, or even like east winds will bring that warm water closer to shore then the fish will start moving in and then of course obviously you have more fish coming from the south doing their migration they uh there'll be so many that it'll kind of just push them in and it kind of pushes the bait up on the shelf on the continental shelf and up towards inshore closer to the beach as we say and that brings the fish in so what about habitat though what about beyond water temperature and and is it just a location for you it's a location destination it's the it is the break and it's just that change or there are other elements that push you more to one direction or another direction how does that work out 
Okay, mahi is 100% structure oriented. Structure is a very vast word. Structure can be like the the a big rock pile underneath the water or a, a wreck, a sunken ship, an old shrimp boat. Like I said, a pile of rocks. Structure can be the pallet that you see floating in the water, which is like the that's like the golden child of, of structure. Everybody dreams of seeing a pallet covered with dolphin. Um, refrigerators, trees, um, rip currents where you have one temperature of water touching another temperature of water. And when those two temperatures touch, it creates a rip. Like one temperature, like a, a 74 degree water will be traveling north and a 76 degree water will be traveling south or vice versa. Um, Anything that is different is considered structure. Our temperature breaks, weed lines especially, weed lines are really starting like now, we're we'll starting to see broken up weeds a little bit. And then as those east winds start moving and that, that sargassum weed starts to move closer inshore, it'll, it'll stack that grass up and those fish are gonna be around the grass. They're gonna be around the wrecks. They're gonna be around the rock piles and the uh, we say the break and that's so that's kind of a bad word to use, but the break isn't like a gradual fall off and it's a straight line from north to south down our coast. There's, there's points and, and all kinds of stuff that will hold baits and create upwellings and upwellings as many people on here have talked before as, as well as me, um, upwellings are where the current like will hit a rock or a wreck and it'll wash up invertebrates and, and, and bait fish and it'll raise it to the surface and then you have your pelagics there. So wherever the bait is, is where the fish are gonna be. The bait is gonna be on the rips or the temperature breaks or the, the color changes or the rock piles or the wrecks or whatever, whatever. So if I'm doing my homework the day before, the night before, I'm guessing I can find information that'll show me at least close proximity of the temperature break. Um, Am I able to do homework the night before to help me find anything else? Upwellings? I mean, how do you how do you get a good sense of where the weed line grass line might be on any given day? Um, the weed line and grass line, you're gonna we assume and, and you know theoretically your weed lines are gonna be on your temperature breaks where you're going from say seventy one degree water to seventy two or I mean seventy three degree water. Uh your weed lines will be there. There are numerous outlets on the web where you can get this information. You can use apps and all kinds of stuff. Um, I'm not promoting, but I'm just saying I use an app called Satfish. It's a one time a year price, you know, I mean, I'll charge and you get it for the whole year. And you can go on there and look at sea surface temperatures. You can look at chlorophyll charts. You can look at altimetry, which is the height of the sea. And uh, this, if you kind of imagine like a, a swimming pool, like if you if you pop a boogie board or something or a float and you make the swimming pool go up and down, the ocean does the same thing with the upwelling currents. So an upwelling will create a vacuum which will suck the sea height down. So if you look at an altimetry chart, you can see the sea heights, the higher points of water of sea level, like if I have a sea level that if my altimetry chart says 1.1 with an up arrow, that means I'm 1.1 feet above sea level. And then, you know, 10 miles away from it, I've got 1.1 or negative 1.1. That means that's 1.1 feet below sea level. So that's where I'm going as far as altimetry goes. Chlorophyll is the same way. The chlorophyll charts, it'll show you, um, I think they use it like any charts that you use is like a, a red and yellow and green and blue. Um, but you want to go to areas where the chlorophyll is concentrated. The chlorophyll is what feeds the bait fish. The bait fish is what feeds the mahi. So um, I, there's so many daggone apps and stuff that you can use. I use satfish. Then you got the sea surface temperatures, which you can get a shot from the day before or that day, or you can do a like a three day, uh, chart where they they do a three-day combination of SSDs and it gives you you can kind of see where that water is moving 
So if I'm going fishing tomorrow, I'm going to look at the sea surface temperatures from today, yesterday, and the day before. And when you do that, you can see the eddies of warm water or cooler water or whatever spinning off the Gulf Stream and moving up the beach and closer to inshore. And you can kind of calculate, and it's not going to be exact, but you can kind of calculate the general area where you need to start. And, and um, I always associate that when I'm mahi fishing. I always associate the sea surface temperature and the, the altimetry. I associate it together, and I try to find uh, the pocket of water. If I find an eddy of water, I look on a, a map layer that shows me wrecks, and that's where I'll start is around those wrecks or around um, points of interest, if you, you know, like, like West Rock or 240 Rock or the Yancey Reef or... For you guys down south, the steeples, um, the devil's a-hole, um, go up north, you have the Mount Chase, you got all kinds of areas like that. So I use all that, and, and like I said, you can go online, there's plenty of, of apps and uh, information out there. Um, gosh, there's the Hilton's charts. You can pay like 70 bucks and get a Ross report, and a Ross report is kind of like a fish here chart. Um, I don't, I used to use that. I don't use it anymore because now I know how to read these maps. I can save 70 bucks every time I go fishing. I just read the map myself. So, so I got, I mean, I was in on all that. I got one follow-up question and it is on the altimetry on the upwelling. It would make sense to me that an upwelling would read at a 1.1 plus, not a 1.1 minus. Why is it that an upwelling of water would actually read at a negative sea surface level? Because the water, say this is the continental shelf, and the water is hitting the continental shelf, you would think if you took physics in high school or college or if you just have plain common sense, you would think that the current hitting that wall and pushing up and will make the sea height go up. Right. But it's actually quite opposite. The, the water hits the, the, the shelf and creates that turbulence, and you're going to be like, Duh, you've seen a river. Everybody's seen rapids in a river. And you have a rock right here, and the water's going over the rock. Well, there's a big pocket of water in front of the rock because that that churning of the water, it sucks it down. Does that make sense? Yeah, man. No, that's a great description. That I mean that that makes sense. I yeah, I was the same category. way. When I was learning that altimetry, and I, like I took these expensive, ridiculous seminars like online seminars back when you couldn't do like we didn't have facebook and instagram and stuff back then so like you had to use dial up and take these classes through these guys down in like panama and stuff like that because i'm a fish nerd man i can't get enough information but they were telling me that stuff and i was like that doesn't make any sense at all whatsoever you would think that the upwelling would create a higher sea surface temperature but i mean if you think about it you going down a river and you go over a rock it sucks you down in there perfect sense Man, uh, no, I'm in. And I, again, I like how you explained it out. I follow that. So that was, I love how that conversation went with the uh, where, and especially, you know, with doing the homework. Um, if I haven't set you up to say anything more about where, we can move to the what, it, unless you got something else for where that, again, I just haven't done my job to set you up to say. The best thing when people ask me, where do you catch or where did y'all catch those? I, and this is, I'm not joking. You will not catch a fish on your couch. Get in your boat and go fishing. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. So you just got to get out best, there. That's and, the best way. And how loose are you when you're headed out, man? Are you a pretty determined, like, I have identified this spot? Or do you often get derailed from that plan because you see something on the way out that is actually more inviting at the moment? Okay. I'm glad you asked that. I used to be that guy, what we call numbers guys, where everybody knows what the big rock is. And on the first week of June, hey, man, the mob big gaffers are here. I'm going to the big rock. That's where the fish are. That used to be a huge mistake that I made. And I would catch fish, but it was usually on the way home when I had fished there for four hours and not caught anything. So I have learned that, yes, I'm heading to a specific area in a sense where I've done my homework the night before with the sea surface temperatures, the chlorophyll charts, the currents, the altimetry, and the the wreck or the piece of structure that I'm I'm heading towards. But the entire time I'm going, 
I'm watching for birds. I'm watching for color changes in the water. Color changes are huge. Um, and I'm not talking about the color change when you leave the inlet and you have the brown water that's touching that king green water. We call it green water. We call it king green. Uh, I'm looking for any kind of change. I'm looking for, like I said before, pallets, refrigerators, logs. Um, some people get too excited if, you, if, you're, if you're going to your spot and you pop a flying fish, a flying fish pops up, and they say, oh, there's a flying fish. Pull them down, drop them, boys. That's not necessarily what I do. If I see a flying fish, I'll keep on going, and I'll, you know, I'll keep that in the back of my head like, hey, I just saw a flying fish, okay? So I'm looking at my graph, and I'm looking at the water temperature, which I'm doing at all times. You always watch your water temperature. And I watch under my boat, and I'll see if I'm marking bait when I'm going with my transducer. On all the boats I've ever had, my transducer reads while I'm going. So I'm watching my temperature. I'm watching the bottom, looking for bait. Now, if I go through and I, you know, I bump one flying fish here and one flying fish there, I know I'm in a good area, but that's not I'm not necessarily going to stop. I'm going to be looking for other things: birds, grass, um, debris in the water, um, color changes, especially from like green to blue. You, a dolphin really want to be in blue water. They don't want to be in what we call the king green water. Um, but if I go through when I bust up, say, a dozen flying fish or uh, another kind of telltale sign is if a flying fish jumps up or two or three flying fish jumps up, jump up and they they fly straight for a minute and then they peel off to the side. Usually that's a telltale sign that not necessarily I'm not going to say there's 500 dolphins in the area, but there, that's usually a telltale sign that there is a predator in the area because they won't fly and land straight down. They're, they're trying to. You scared them with the boat, maybe, but it, it's a very good chance that you probably startled a predator fish and they spun around and when they spun around, that flying fish said, oh crap, and tried to get out of there. So if I see two or three get up, I'm, I'm really interested. If I see one get up every here and there, that's, that doesn't really grab my attention. If I see a dozen get up and like shower and sprinkle all out, yes, I'm dropping lines right there. Uh, like I said, if you see two or three get up and they're going, they fly straight, and they land in the water that you know keep that in the back of your head watch your graph look for your temperature change or whatever watch the look for your bait but if they two or three jump up and they spin and turn off to the side then i'm really i'll slow the boat down a little bit and start looking around and definitely check it for birds big time well then let's let's use this as an opportunity man you saw something you like whether it's on the way out or whether it's part of the plan from the homework before um let's talk about the spread let's talk about what to use that's the funnest, the, the best thing about mahi is you can use anything. Chicken wings, I mean, anything, you can use anything. Uh, I like to pull feathers this time of the year in the spring. I don't know if you can see that. We call them tuna feathers. Yeah. Pull these in the springtime. Um, no weight, no ballyhoo, no nothing, just, just a feather. Um, and you'll catch black fins and yellow fins on these. And... I also, I also always pull rig ballyhoo. I rig my ballyhoo on a short rigger, which it doesn't matter what name brand you use. That's just what I use. Short rigger sea witches. This color is actually called mahi. It's a uh, blue and blue and chartreuse green. Um, this is a regular what we call a pin rig. And as you can see, you guys know that in the in the early early spring right now, we have wahoos are very prevalent. Can you see that? Yeah. See the pin in it? That's what I use. And this pin is out of number nine wire and it goes all through the hook. That way, if I get bit by a toothy critter, whether it be a barracuda, a king mackerel, or a wahoo, I have a better chance of hanging them on because he doesn't spot, um, pop the mono. Which brings me to another point. When I'm mahi fishing, I'm pulling um, either mono or fluorocarbon. I'm just no wire in my spread whatsoever. And so, okay. why is that? Um, the Mahis, if you ever see a Mahis owl, I mean, they can see from from Wilmington to Cape Lookout. They, they, they can see everything. They're very, Mahis are very aware of everything that's going on. It, like I say about every fish, they have two jobs in the world, and that is to make babies and to survive. And in order to survive, they have to eat. So a Mahis are, everybody thinks they're the fastest growing fish in the ocean, but they're not necessarily the fastest, but they are one of the fastest. Um, there's actually a Mahi on record that gained, he was tagged by Thomas Flyer, and I think 11 months later, he had gained like, 
he or she had gained 31 pounds or something or 33 pounds or something. That's a lot of meat. That's more than COVID weight. That's more than the COVID gain. It's insane, man. So they are fast growing fish. Um, that old cliche saying they have tails, they will swim real quick. I'm going to touch back on the where if I have a wreck, say that's three miles from another wreck or a piece of structure or a point of interest that's three miles from another point of interest. And I troll around one and I don't pick up anything. I don't pick my baits up and go to the next spot. I troll from that spot to the other. Cause remember these fish, they're, they're moving all the time. They never stop moving. Hope I didn't mess up by interrupting the no man bread thing. This is a, what we call a mahi plug. It's like a little chugger plug. These things are cheap. This is actually a short rigger as well. These things are cheap. You can pull these naked or you can put a ballyhoo on them or a finger mullet. I'm, uh, Boston mackerel doesn't matter. As you can see, I got the pin in that one too. I don't know if you can see. Yep. So these things are cheap. Um, I want to say they're like seven or eight bucks a piece. Uh, I'll pull as far as uh as far as on what position I'm pulling stuff, I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, here's another big plug. This is huge. And it, I've caught, I mean, this is the same, same exact kind of plug. It's just bigger. You can see the size difference. See the size difference in those? Yes. All right. I've caught multiple fish over 30 pounds on that lure with no bait on it, just the lure. So what goes into the decision of putting bait on it or not? I guess that's just personal preference. Me okay. personally, I like what we call, everybody said, I like to have meat in the water, which means I like to put bait on stuff. If uh, When I'm gaffer fishing, I have bait in the water, except for my shotgun, which is what I usually pull that blue and that big blue and white one I just showed you. I pull it. Um, on the shotgun with, with no bait on it. Um, the reason I don't put a bait on it way back there is because it's popping in and out of the water, almost like a marlin lure and creating just a whole bunch of ruckus and that bait will get washed out and tore up and it'll be ruined. Okay. This is another staple lure. Now it's pink. I know I realize it's pink and I'm going to get people going to say stuff, but this is a green machine. This is a pink green machine. You can buy these at any tackle shop you go into that has hooks, weights, or anything that has to do with offshore fishing. They're called green machines. And you can pull, we've gone out there and pulled nothing but green machines on in our entire spread. Um, both flat lines green machines, both shorts green machines, both long green machines, and a shotgun green machine. And stacked dolphin up in the boat. Once a... Uh, when something's working, I don't change it, which is like I tell you about all my fishing stuff, whether it's sailfish, marlin, wahoos, whatever. Whatever's working, that's what I'm, I'm pulling. Um, we also run birds. Everybody knows what a bird is. Birds, we pull daisy chains behind them. You can't really see. I have about a six-foot squid chain right here on this bird. I'll pull this on the shotgun. This is a shotgun bait. You do not pull this beside the boat. This is made by Boone. Okay. Not that that matters, but um, that's a long bait. So I've showed you what baits we have. We also pull teasers. I'm not going to open it. This is a squid chain. These are nine inch squids. There are five of these on here. There's no hook on this. But there are, there's a snap swivel on the end of it. It's five squids in a straight line. And on the end of that, there's a snap swivel. And on that snap swivel, you can actually connect one of these plugs or a green machine, and it makes a fantastic mahi bait. Um, I have another one right here that we use, and this is actually the same thing, except it's flying fish. I can pull it out if you would like me to. But uh, I like to have teasers in the water because I want to create a lot of commotion. Now, when I'm mahi fishing, I will put baits on the end of my teasers or, you know, my squid chains. 
if I'm wahoo fishing or if I'm self fishing or if I'm marlin fishing, I do not do that because I do not want the fish to come up and eat it and get hooked to it and rip my teaser reels off of my teeth off. So um, this, this is a, a huge attraction device or what some people call fads, fish attracting device. And as you can see, these are flying fish and little baby flying fish. This is made by Fish Razor as well. And on the back of this flying fish, we have a chugger, just like that. Inside this chugger, we have a spot where you can put a double snap swivel on there and you can hook a bait to it, or you can put a hook on there. It's up to you, it's whatever you want to do. So now that I've showed you my baits, um, as far as my spread goes, I started off really offshore fishing on a 21 foot center console with a I think I had a 225 Evan Rude exploding bomb hanging off the back of the boat. Um, <laughs> when I got the boat, I didn't have outriggers. So I was pulling two corner baits off of my transom, which were my shorts. And then I would pull, or uh, my flats, I'm sorry. And then I had 45 degree rocket launch, I mean, uh, rod holders in my gunnels. And I would run my shorts, if you will, off of those. And then I had the rocket launchers in the T-tops and I would my, what we call the kingfish launchers. I would put two more rods up there and I put my teasers in the shorts. I put my ballyhoos on the flat lines with the sea witches. Um, and you can use Islanders too. I like Islanders. And then in the top, I would always, no matter what you're fishing for, what kind of species it is. Um, Jeremy from Calypso has really, he, he has the, the best approach to it, or the, the best, I guess, uh, theory. Put your prettiest baits as f the furthest from the boat. So you want your nice, pretty lures further back. And this is if you don't have outriggers, or if you do have outriggers, it doesn't matter. Um, so that's my spread, or was my spread. Now I'm on a 28-foot contender running outriggers with teaser reels, and we're running sometimes three lines on each outrigger, and we have... One, two, three, four, five lines inside the boat. So we're running up to nine lines sometimes, um, which is overkill for a lot of people. And you don't need to do that. If you have one fishing rod and one bait, you can go out there and catch mahi on that. So don't, don't let it discourage you because you don't have a quarter million dollar center console. Like, you know, like everybody else and you got, 20 million dollars in tackle and you don't have to have all that mahi it's, it's like bass fishing it's just it's fun just get out there and do it man so on a typical spread you know starting out before you might figured out what's dialed in that day on a typical spread whether it's six lines or more are half of them bait half of them have meat i mean do you have any theory you know do you have any kind of general approach formula to how many with bait how many not yeah me i'm gonna pull on my we get there, we blow up a big school of flying fish. We're on a weed line. We're gonna put them out. I'll throw my shotgun out first. I always throw your longest shot, your longest lure out first. I'll throw my shotgun out, which is the bird with a squid chain or, or that big um, chugger plug I showed you. And I'll throw that out way long. And then I'll put two Islanders or two sea witches with meat on my longs, way back in the clean water, my prettiest baits. And they, they have bait on them. They usually have ballyhoo. And that's just me. I like meat in the water. I've caught just as many fish on naked baits as I have meat, but it's just my preference. I, I feel like if you go to a buffet and there's a salad bar and there's no steak, you're not going to be as interested. If there's a steak sitting up there, you're going to eat a steak. So I throw meat on the hooks. So I got my shotgun with my chugger or my bird. Then I'll put my two longs out which is my sea witches or Islanders. And that's your personal preference. I like Islanders when it's rough because I can keep them down low, but if it's nice and calm outside, I can run sea witches and they stay just, they stay out there just as pretty. And then I'll put my shorts out on my short rigger, I should say. And I'll let them swim beside the boat for a minute. And then I'll drop my teasers back and I'll drop my shorts back at the same time. I want my short to be right behind my teaser. 
that way if a fish comes up and misses that like the squid chain teaser bait if he comes up and misses the bait or if he short strikes it i can feed him the short and it's already right there in front of his face he can eat it and then i'll put my flat lines out all right Does that all make sense? man uh so as far as getting the spread out and now we're trolling like so what insights have you gained as far as like what to do once the spread is successful out there? We're not tangling. We're working our other area, like a certain speed. Do you mix up the speed going on both sides of the temperature break on both sides of the weed line? Like what have you, what insights can you share that you've gathered through your own experiences of now the spreads in the water? Okay. I will tell you first of all, on the weed line and I used to make the same mistake, uh, or this mistake, I should say. Traveling up and down a weed line, you do not want to get too close to the weed line. Okay. What you'll do when you when you when you get too close to the weed line, and I'm talking like 20 yards or you know, 50, 60 feet, uh, 20 or 30 yards, when you're up close to the weed line like that, yes, you can catch fish like that, but the when your boat's going up the side of the weed line, you'll startle the bait fish that are underneath the weed line and they'll go to the other side of it. I don't want to do that. I also don't want to tangle up my stuff all in grass. I don't want to be shagging grass all day. If you have a piece of grass or if any bait that you have is not swimming right, you're wasting your time. I would rather have one bait that's swimming good than to have two dozen baits out there that look like junk. So don't get too close to weed lines. Now, as far as temperature break rips, um, color change rips, or weed lines, I usually start on the clean side that's where i'll start and when you when you're traveling up and down these breaks especially weed line you can look underneath grass from 100 yards away and you can see the bait underneath there if you're going up grass and it's not green it's like it's brown and it just doesn't look like it has any life on it then i won't spend a lot of time on it um, as far as the temperature breaks go like i same thing with the, with the weed line i'll start on the clean side i want to be on the clean water but that's not necessarily what side of the fish are on. That's, as humans, that's what we think. These fish want to be in clean, oxygenated, blue, purplish water. That's where they want to be. But like I've said in some other seminars that I do or um, some other, like speaking with our captains at, at different places, sometimes your, your blue water and your green water is side by side up on top. So if you look at it from a side view, Sometimes that blue water will go up underneath the green water or vice versa. Sometimes the green water goes up underneath the blue water. So that is something that you have to figure out when you're there. As far as starting out, I would start out on the clean side, whether it be grass, current rip, temperature rip, it doesn't matter. How about, and, uh, you know, I, I don't, if you've got more to add, I certainly don't want to move this on without, without giving you a chance to add more. But a, a thought that always sort of interests me is like, what do you do once you have a bite? Like, you know, am I staying at a trolling speed indefinitely for a little bit? What lines do you bring in? What lines do you leave out? You know, walk me through, especially if we're talking May and June, like gaffer dolphin, what happens on your boat? Yeah, me, um, and I, I never even say it, but I usually trap, I'm usually trolling at six and a half knots to, to eight knots, sometimes nine knots, depending. Um, that the speed itself does not matter to me. I want the bait swimming right. So if my baits are swimming right at four knots and I speed up to five knots and they're swimming like crap, I'll go back to four knots and, and vice versa the other way. I want my bait swimming right. That's what matters to me on that. Um, if I get a fish on and, and I've had people on my boat to be like, hey man, slow it down, slow it down. I do not slow down. I keep fishing. Just because I have a fish on, if I if I can look and see where he's at or she's at, and, and I know I'm not going to get tangled up, I'm going to keep fishing, and I'm going to slowly move, you know, away from the weed line if there is one. I'm going to move away from the weed line because I don't want that fish going and busting up the weeds and getting all tore up and getting me grassed up. Um, but typically, I will not slow down mahi fishing, um, even with the big ones. I, if I see a forty pound dolphin jump and sky out my main focus is that fish now i don't care about any other fish i'm trying to catch that big super duper gaffer i mean that's what you're out there for so 
my main focus on that fish, my, my, main, my main focus is that fish. My main focus on that fish is to keep him tight. Dolphins are very, they are acrobatic fish. They're going to jump, shake their heads. Dolphin, when they bite, or mahi, I call them dolphin. When they bite, they don't go down like a tuna. They don't. They don't like dig off the side of the boat and try to sound on you. It, they will stay out flat. They'll go left or right or or backwards. They but they usually stay in like the top ten or fifteen feet of water. So I would use the boat and try to. I'll stay tight on that fish and I always want to keep them at a forty-five. I don't want them straight off the back of the boat, but I'll use the boat to keep that fish tight at all times. Um, a lot of times when you catch a dolphin, it doesn't take long and, and another one will go off and another one will go off and you'll have two on, three on. Sometimes, I mean, we've had every rod on the boat go off before. And that can be a cluster. So that is going to be your experience on your boat and how you handle that. I would say get the short fish in first as fast as you can. Work your way out to the long fish. Um, with a big fish, I, I'm worried about him. And, and if if I know he's staying off my port side, and I can still have baits out on the, on my starboard side, I'm going to keep those baits out, and I'm going to keep trolling. You know, four and a half to six knots as long as I'm staying tight on him. As long as I'm gaining ground on him and he's not burning me off the reel, you know, to where I can't keep up with him, then that's how I'm going to approach that situation. Does that cover what you're asking? For yeah, you? man, that does. That certainly does. And so, you know, I guess it's more of a bale or dolphin phenomenon where you're going to keep one in the boat or keep one in the water just to keep the other fish excited. But we're not doing that with the bigger fish. I mean, certainly the commotion might attract something else, but we're getting that fish in the boat. Yes, and that's all because I'm so daggone excited that I've got a 45-pound dolphin beside the boat. When you see... It, when you look over a gunnel, and you I don't care what kind of boat you're on, and you see a lime green and iridescent blue, yellow, flashing white piece of plywood with a fin on it beside the boat, and his eyes that big around, it'll make you do stuff like that you know you, you didn't know you could do. Um, you'll turn into either the biggest dummy on the water, or you'll turn into a professional real fast. So, well, I'm not going to get a 40 pound dolphin up to the side of the boat and say, keep him in the water, y'all. There's more fish with him. That is, <laughs> no, not me, buddy. I'm putting a gaff in that fish and he's going in the box. So, when you have people on the boat that, you know, are, are less experienced, inexperienced, however we want to word it, what is, a, how do you coach them once they're hooked up and once they got the rod and reel in their hand? Like, what are the mistakes that people make or what are the tips that you give them just to increase the chances that that fish makes it in the box? Okay, a lot of people, just like with wahoo fishing, a lot of people that don't know any better, when they grab a rod and reel, they want to crank the drag up on it. Well, I'll set the we'll, we set the drags for these fish, and when we when we hand the reel to the the angler, if they're ready for that, then we'll we'll kind of coach them through it. You never let your rod tip get point straight at the fish. You never let it come straight up. You always keep it between like you know ten and twelve, if you will. Um, and you want to keep a bend in the rod, even if you're cranking and you're not gaining any line, you, you need to keep on cranking as long as you can to keep the pressure on the fish. And like I said, I will control my, uh, that's a bad word to use, but I'll try my best to keep that fish under control while the angler's uh, reeling that fish in. The best way to reel in a fish is with Rodney. And everybody knows who Rodney is, Rodney the rod holder. Rodney the rod holder has killed, or has boxed more fish than probably any human alive. So if an angler is brand new on the boat and they've never caught a fish, any kind of pelagic or kingfish or anything for that matter, we will stick the rod and reel in the corner rock, uh, rod holder and I'll let the angler crank on the fish and kind of get a feel for it and, and kind of learn the fish. It's There's a different feeling. Um, with a pelagic fish. Pelagics, like kingfish, they're not, that's not necessarily a pelagic fish. A kingfish will scream off 150 yards and then he turns into dead weight. Bahis, tunas, uh, 
wahoos, sailfish, whatever, pelagic fish, they'll peel off 100 yards and then they'll kind of go docile for a second. And then they'll peel off another 60 yards. Then they'll go docile. Then they'll peel off 150 yards. So you have to stay tight on the whole time. And also, you also have to imagine, I need something to use for an example. Um, a dolphin is flat just like this. You know, that's how their body profile is. They're flat. So if I'm pulling a fish off the corner of a boat and he turns, he, it's almost like a planer board. And that fish will put an intense amount of pressure on your rod and reel. So that's why I don't want you pinning the drag. Or I don't like seeing people push that drag up. Um, I guess the easiest way to say it is stay tight on them, keep reeling. And keep that rod between 10 and 2. Don't go slack on them. And why is it that you like to keep the fish about at a 45-degree angle behind the boat? I, I like that because when I, when I have the fish at a 45-degree angle, in most cases, I still have baits off the other side. So I will keep those baits. I'm watching the fish the whole time, but I'm also watching my other baits. So... Uh, All the white water and the current coming from your motors and the air bubbles and all that, I don't want any interference with between me and that fish. I want to be able to see that fish the whole time or at least be able to see that line and where it's going the whole time. It's just, for me, it's, a, it's easier for me to control that fish, and I feel better about it when I've got that pressure on him at a 45-degree angle rather than straight off the back of the boat. All right, I follow. Um, I think, man, this has been a good conversation, but I never like to wrap it up before saying any final thoughts, Mike, anything I, anything I didn't set you up to say. No, um, it's just, there's so much information for any kind of fishing, especially, but I mean, with Mahi, there's so much information. People can get so overwhelmed with it. You kind of have to go back to your roots. Mahi fishing is like bobber fishing for brim and crappie but you're doing it in in blue water and um as far as location and time i'm going to touch back on that these fish in april and may they're getting here they're in the gulf stream they're in 300 feet of water all the way out to a thousand feet of water sometimes three thousand feet of water as the time goes on into you know the end of june um beginning of july July and August is kind of hot, but they're still, they're still sprinkled out there. You can catch these fish three miles off the beach. Well, I'm going to change that. I'm going to say 10 miles off the beach, but uh, Hollywood actually caught a dolphin. Hollywood, he mates for me, and I mate for him on his boat. He caught a dolphin Spanish fishing in the surf right in front of AB in, I think it was like July 4th weekend or something. This was like seven or eight years ago. He, he called me and told me, and I was like, shut up, dude, you're crazy. He sent me a picture. I was like, are you kidding me? A dolphin in the surf. But he did, man. He caught a little mahi about this big. So, and the reason I want to bring that up is because, like I said, when we first started this off, you can have, me and Hollywood, we started off fishing with a, I think it was an 18-foot G3 with a 40-horsepower tiller handle. We were taking that thing 10 miles offshore, catching dolphin, and and people were like, are you guys crazy? You're insane. We're like, dude, it's, it's fine. We could see the lighthouse where we were. It was you got to pick your days, but no matter the size of your boat or the tackle you have, you can do it. I mean, don't overwhelm yourself and don't overthink it and don't try to put too much information in your mind when it comes to my heat. Just chill out, have fun, catch fish. Man, uh, Mike, thank you very much. I've, uh, I enjoy talking fishing with you any chance I get. Cool deal, man. I appreciate you. I'm glad you have me, man. Yeah, man. Next time. I mean, I know already there'll be a next time. Again, it's good to talk to you. All right, brother. I'll see you. Billy. So much mahi, man. Mahi, mahi, mahi. Wow. Man, they're fun. Like you said, stuff, they're yeah. lit up. The colors in the water, the acrobatic yeah. show they put on. Man, they're one of my favorites. I think you and I went one time. I, and I remember catching the biggest one that day. <laughs> I think you got a picture to prove it. <laughs> hey, man. Like the guy said, it's easy. It's like bass fishing or crappie fishing, bro. I yeah. crushed it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I got a picture. I'm going to bring that. I'm going to find that picture. I know I caught the biggest one that day. When you elbowed me to get to the rod first. Probably. 
I mean, whatever it takes. When you fish with Gary Hurley, you got to play dirty or you don't get to catch any fish at all. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have a better chance of survival in a prison yard than fishing with Gary. I'm tempted to counter, <laughs> but you know what? I'll let people believe what they want to believe. I'm actually... I'm actually very much enjoying the picture you're painting of me through all these podcasts of what I'm like to fish with on the boat. And I don't think I want to challenge it. I think I just want people to believe the picture you're trying to paint. I tell you, man, I'll line up the people who've been fishing with you and they will just be like, yeah, he's, this is true. Like it's not a picture. <laughs> oh, what was man. your best takeaway? I um, mean, I think, if, you know, it's kind of funny because I remember on that trip we went on, where they you were, caught the biggest fish. Where I caught the biggest fish. Uh -huh. That they were, whole, you know, had one mahi, like, hanging out after they hooked up on it. The mate did. And I was like, I guess even all this time I ever thought, like, why the freak did they ever do that? I never even asked the question on the boat that day. And then you guys answered it, like, to get the other fish stirred up. And I was like, oh, that seems... <laughs> I was just like, God, why are these guys not putting this in the boat? Like, let's go, <laughs> you know? But that makes more sense. I mean, to hold a couple fish in the water and let them, let them get everybody else excited, I guess. So... Yeah, good tip. I'm gonna do that when I take my ten foot John boat ten miles off. I was like, I was thinking that too, and he said that. I'm like, that's crazy as crap, man. But whatever you gotta do, man. I'm getting a tiller handle. You should, and you should go <laughs> offshore <laughs> and take a picture for Mike. I'm like, Mike, me too, man. I me did it too. too. I did it too. Oh man, crazy dude. What people will do for Mahi anyway? Go support Marine Warehouse Center, man. And um. And, and yeah, go, and even in Charleston, South Carolina area, for people watching and listening, go check out their store in, in the area down there as well and uh, buy a boat. Get out there. Sales, service, parts, man, they do it all. They got you. They got you covered. You want a relationship with them. They want a relationship with you. It makes total sense to me. All right. Well, until then, next time, Gary, I'm going to go out fish you some more. So until then. Okay. All right. Bring your biggest fish picture. I'll bring mine. We'll see. You. All right. <laughs> no, dude, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, whatever. If I went fishing like a hundred times a year and people handed me a rod with a big fish <laughs> on the end of it, I can bring. There's that <laughs> false narrative again, and there's that false narrative. Oh man. All right, dude. It's good to see you, Gary. It's an awesome show, and we'll see you later. Later, man. Fishing.